But look, a little bit about me. Um, I'm a strength guy. Uh, I was born with a big neck. I'm from Georgia. And uh, yeah, so I, all right, so let me just back up. I'm still reeling from what we just saw, so I need to get focused here. Any, any tips on that? I think I got some good breathing uh, tips from, from Ingrid today. Uh, but anyway, look, look, here's the deal. I've spent 15, 16 years of my life throwing a 16-pound steel ball as far away from me as possible. It took me around the world. I literally had the opportunity to meet and work out with some of the most intelligent strength coaches, uh, performance specialists all around the world, all because I had this talent. I could throw a 16-pound steel ball as far away from me as possible and usually farther than the other guys. I threw it 74 feet. For a frame of reference, that's from the basketball free throw line, turn around and throw it over the baseline on the opposite side of the basketball court. That's what I did. I had no idea what the shot put was, shot put was when I first started sports. I was going to be a football player. John Welburn, who I, I talked about this at Summer Strong, I wanted, to, I wanted to have his life. I wanted to go be an NFLer. I wanted to be a 10-year veteran. I wanted to, that's what I thought I would do as a kid. But what ended up happening was I didn't grow like John did. <laughs> I lost my hair. Um, so any, but anyway, I'm not going to get on those sidetracks there. Um, I was, so eighth grade year was the year that everything changed for me, okay? And so what ended up happening was I, I, moved, I moved back to Georgia. We'd been in Virginia for a couple of years. My dad was working for the government. We moved back to Georgia, and I moved to this school, and they had this, these great sports programs. And I went from being the top of the sports programs to what I, where I was before these little club sports or church league sports to, like, in a school that had great sports programs. I did okay in football. But I was a basketball player, too. I got cut from basketball, went out for wrestling. No cut policy. That's a good thing. And, uh, but I was like, I'm going to be a baseball player, too. That was sort of my backup plan if the NFL didn't work out. And I can remember going out there the very first day of baseball practice, and I'm like, this is going to be awesome. I've been working really hard. And uh, I think it was day two of, of uh, baseball practice. Uh, the coach calls me into his office, and I'm new to the school. I think he's going to give me that attaboy speech. And uh, he says, um, Nelson, and he had a lisp. He was kind of a jerk, too. <laughs> he goes, he just, in a stutter, he just, I'm not making this up. This is true. <laughs> you're, just, you're just not good enough. Not only that, you're never going to be good enough. I'm like 12 years old. Can you imagine saying that to a child today? Like, like they'd be crushed. But I was like, this is, this is awesome. This is an opportunity because I didn't want to play baseball. I wanted to play football. So I go home and I tell my dad, I'm like, look, dad, I got cut from the baseball team today. And you know what he said to me? He said, okay, well, that's great. What are you going to do next? I said, well, uh, I was going to train for football. You know, get a full six months of training in, be the first freshman to ever play varsity football at my high school. He said, yeah, you could do that. Or you could get a job. Well, 12 years old in Atlanta, Georgia, the jobs that were available to me weren't really that great. And I, I, this is quite true. that You could go work at the Baskin Robbins with a lady whose name, I'm sure she's dead now, so I'll say this. Her name was Mrs. Hawkins. She liked to get very friendly with the young men that she hired. It was, you learned a lot about life, apparently, working at the 31 Flavors. <laughs> It did not necessarily appeal to me, so I, I, I had to come up with a backup plan, and I, and, and I went out for track and field. It had a no-cut policy. So I knew, like, this is going to be good, but I was really going to go and spend that time training. And then something happened. I found my passion. I found this thing called throwing. Now, I didn't start off doing it. I did every single event under the sun. I did the 100, the 200, the 400, the 800, the mile, the high jump, the long jump, shot put discus, and the pole vault for one day. That's a whole nother story. And um, it's a short story because it was only one, one day. But uh, I learned that I'm not that stupid. It's a, yeah. Anyway. Um, but as I grew and I got better, and I had this big growth, uh, growth phase from, from my eighth grade year into my freshman year. I literally started off my eighth grade year at about five, six, 
uh, 135 pounds, uh, and then started my freshman year at about 5'11 or 5'10, 205 pounds. My parents hated me. I ate so much food, you cannot believe it. I would, we would drive up to, to fast food restaurants, really the Philly, Philly Connection. It was a chain, if you don't know, anyway. They, they would see our car and start making more steak right away. No joke, because I would have two larges and a small, or three larges. I'd go to Domino's and order two large pizzas and crush them. I was a machine, and I just all I did was eat, and eat, and eat, and my parents just hated me. That was the only reason why they hated me, eating. Um, and, but anyway, I found, I found this passion. I started growing. I started getting bigger. I, started, I, I, I realized that once I was about 205 pounds, 220 pounds, that the 800 was not a good event for me. <laughs> And I found out that I could also lift and train for football and be a pretty good thrower. And, and so I continued to evolve as a thrower. And I had the opportunity to go to college uh, at, at Dartmouth College and do both football and track. That was really important for me. And while I was at Dartmouth, I actually, um, let me take a step back. I also found the weight room in eighth grade. And I had this opportunity not to work out with knowledgeable, knowledgeable folks like you, but to work out with the extraordinarily intelligent, well-intentioned, totally misguided uh, juniors and seniors who knew everything and were not, a shared, and not, were not scared to share that information with an eighth grader. I went to a weight room that you could call our laboratory. And the information that we got, how many of you guys remember Muscle Magazine back in the day? Muscle Mag. Muscle Mag. That was like the only access I had to any sort of knowledgeable strength and conditioning. So like me and hundreds workout, like I would crush that thing. I would crush that. You guys know what the hundreds were? Y'all probably don't even know what the hundreds workout. I do, bro. What is it, bro? 100 repetitions. You do 100 repetitions of big movements. Yeah, everything. Like we, I did it in everything. Literally, like I would do 100 repetitions and I'd be like, okay, this, is, this was actually the way you did it. You set off with 100 reps. And whatever weight you chose, didn't matter. If you couldn't get to 100 reps, you take the number that you did and subtract that from the 100, and that was your rest period, then you go again. It was awesome. fucking awesome. <laughs> but here's, here's the thing. I often tell people that my greatest strength as an athlete is not my power, it's not my ability to throw the shot, but it was my ability to endure these horrible workouts without injury. I was extraordinarily resilient. I could go do one of these workouts, come back the next day, do it again. Every workout took two and a half hours. If I wasn't in there for two and a half hours, I didn't feel like I was working out. And that was on top of my practice time. I was the weird kid that read this book called The Athlete's Guide to Mental Training, Mental Training as an Eighth Grader. Who does that? But I, I, I truly believed in what I was doing. I truly believed in the results, and I had great results. As a high school senior, I benched 465 pounds. I squatted 225 pounds for 85 reps. Why, you ask? <laughs> did somebody ask that, or did I say that? <laughs> It's good. Wow. Why? Because, because, honestly, the football coach thought there was a correlation between squat rep test and performance. So this is what we did at the beginning of my senior year. We did a bench rep, sink max rep test. We did the, uh, the squat test, and then we went out and ran the 40. Great order of operations there, guys. <laughs> um, so I can, and I can remember, has anybody ever actually done an 85 rep set? <laughs> okay, I, so I'm going to tell you something about 85 reps. It takes a long fucking time, all right? And I'm sharing this story with you, um, not because I'm particularly proud. In fact, most of the time, I'm actually embarrassed that this is what I did. Um, but I, I'm sharing this story with you because a lot of you work with young kids. All right? Maybe you don't. How many people work with young kids? A good number of you. How many of you people work with, how many of y'all work with old people? 60s, 70s, 80s, right? Young kid, working with young kids and old kids, in some ways, there's a lot of parallels. Now, you don't want to do 85 reps with an old person. Maybe not even over the course of the whole workout with multiple exercises, depending on how old they are and what kind of condition they're in. But movement, repetition of that movement is really, really critical. When they're young, we want to we do this perfect program with them. We want to make sure, oh, crap, man, I'm not loading this correctly. I'm not, look, 
youth, there is a resilience in youth and that gives you a margin of error that as long as you're working the quality of the movement, your loading patterns, your loading, your loading protocols are less important. And I don't want to say abandon science. I'm not saying that at all. But don't stress about the X's and O's when all you're truly working on is getting them their 10,000 reps, okay? That's very, very critical. With the older folks, you gotta worry a little bit more. So then I had this chance to go on to Dartmouth College, and it was a blessing there because I, I didn't mean to. Um, my college coach and I, uh, track coach, he and I disagree. He says he recruited me. I did not hear from the man until I showed up on campus because I was recruited primarily for football, and they said I could do track as well. But I was very lucky because this man was an old man of iron. I talk about the brotherhood of the iron. I've talk, I, I, you hear, you'll hear this term get thrown out. Um, it's something that I know Bert and I have in common. We, we have these, these father figures. He's got a father figure, truly. Uh, this was a father figure of mine who was a godfather of strength in, in the Northeast area. He knew everything about powerlifting, Olympic lifting, and all these other things. And he comes to me and he says, hey, we're going to make you strong. And I'm like, well, I'm already strong. Because what also happens with youth? There's arrogance, right? And it took me a little while to work, work through that arrogance, and, and he humbled me in a number of ways. But I got to the point of my senior year in college, and uh, he, says, he says to me, and I, I was a shot putter at the time, and I think uh, I heard Matt Vincent say, if you weren't 10% better than me, you probably had no business going on to the Olympics or trying out, you know, continuing after college. I don't think I was 10% better than what Matt actually threw. So apparently I lied to myself later on. Um, but anyway, um, my college coach comes to me and says, hey, look, you compete in a world of giants. You're a strong man. I'm not very large for a shot putter. I'm six foot at the time. I was 255 pounds. Pound for pound, I consider myself very strong. But most of the guys I, I competed against look like this gentleman over here in the corner. Yeah. <laughs> so stand up, if you will, Brady. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, but they're six foot four, 340 pounds. They're big human beings. They probably look like John did when he was actually playing football. Um, he's still in good shape now. <laughs> um, but uh, they're, they're giant people. And so he wanted to instill this confidence in me that, hey, look, you see your value. You see your strength. You see your success through what you do in the weight room. If I knew I was stronger than everybody, I knew that I could outperform them. And so he said, we're going to get you strong. We're going to make you believe that you can walk through walls, run through them, lean through them. Whatever I wanted to do to this wall, I could do to it. And he says, so we're going to do a set of 10. Oh, no, no, sorry. Let me back up. He doesn't say that. Sorry. I may have given away the punchline there. But uh, he, he says, we're going, to get you, we're going to get you really strong. You're going to do something big. You're going to do a, a heavy set. We're going to max out, but it's not going to be for a single rep. It's going to be probably for three or five or something like that. And, and every single rep is going to be over 600 pounds. No problem, coach. You're the coach, right? He is my coach. He's, he's been with me for four years. He's been through me, been with me through the thick and I mean, just, I was a jackass. Um, and he helped guide me. He kept, he kept pushing me along, pushing me along. We get to this point. I have this trust with him. I have this belief in him. I said, okay, coach, over 600 pounds. So what we're doing, and we're not really sure where over 600 pounds is going to go. I'd already squatted over 600 pounds. Um, so we were like, we're just see where it goes. So the first, first week we're in there, and this is about um, 12 weeks out from national championships, right? And so the deal was that we were about four to six weeks out from national championships. We we're going to have this max, this max, max day. And um, so he says to me, okay, coach, you're going to get out there. We're going, to, uh, because we're going to do this. First week, I remember I go over 605. I do five reps. No problem. This is great. One, two, three, four, five. Boom. Next week, two sets over, five, uh, two sets over 600 pounds, 605, 615. Next week, 605, 615, 635. Blah, blah. And then it's like it's the time, right? So now all these sets are supposed to be over 600 pounds. We work up. On the last set, I get 665 pounds on the bar. And he throws, calls an audible. Now, let me tell you something. When you get under a bar, and where are my power lifters in the room? Okay? Getting under a bar, what does it take to do that? Question. What does it take to get under a bar? Anyone? Balls. Balls. Courage. You've got to commit to it. The heavier the load, 
the more you have to commit to it. Coach says, we're going to do 665 today, son. We're not going to do it for five reps. We're going to do it for as many reps as you can. I said, okay, coach, because he's my coach. Judd Logan gave a talk a couple years ago, and I thought it was one of the greatest talks I've heard. And he said to me, if you don't know Judd Logan, Judd Logan I think uh, Derek was talking about him, and I think Bert mentioned him as well. Four-time Olympian. He's coached hundreds, if not thousands, of all Americans over the course of his career. Um, and he, gave the, he said, a coach is someone that leads you from point A to point B safely. Their guide. Okay? And this is a man that I had a lot of trust in, a lot of faith in. And he said, we're going to do this. So I get in there, and I said, okay, coach. 665 on the bar. I did have a belt, and I did have wraps on. And uh, he calls the team in and says, guys, big day, all this stuff. He goes, all right, Adam, let's go, let's go, here we go. So I get under there, and I say, okay. <sighs> My breathing, Ingrid. <sighs> I'm, I'm locked in. I'm ready. First, sorry, this thing's sticking me. Hot! Hot! Hunt, hit five reps, no problem. Two more, Adam, two more. And I said, okay, coach. Hunt, hunt. Seven reps down. He goes, three more, Adam. Hunt, hunt. At this point, you start seeing the blood vessels in my eyes go boom, 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 boom. My face is beat red. Everybody in the whole room is like, what the fuck, including me. <laughs> <coughs> and I hit 10 reps, and I stand up, he goes, Two more? <laughs> Fuck you! True story. <sighs> no. I told you my greatest strength was my resilience. Stupid workout, right? 255 pounds, 665 pounds for 10 reps. Six weeks later, I go to the national championships, and I win my first NCAAs as a senior. Now, I'm going to put a caveat, like a little asterisk on this. I timed it really well. Look, timing is a lot of things. The year before, it may have taken about two feet farther. The year before that, it may have taken about seven feet farther. But at the end of the day, I still won an NCAA championships. And that's what I need. God, I'm still breathing hard. Whew. Shot putter. Short burst. <clears throat> so um, it's funny how history repeats itself. I, uh, I went to Dartmouth. And when you graduate from Dartmouth, you're expected to do one thing, get a job. Not any job, but a really good job. You know why? Because they grade themselves based off how much money their, their graduates make. So I can remember I went into this interview uh, with a consulting firm, and I was just, wasn't into it. And I'm like five minutes into this conversation with this guy, and he was clearly having a bad day, and I just really didn't want to be there, and I, 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 just, I just broke. And I said, I really do appreciate your time. It's clear that I don't want to work for you, and you'd rather be doing something else right now. And I got up and left. And I went to my college coach, a guy named Carl Wallen, and I said, Coach, you've been saying something to me for a long time now. You said, you've got a skill. You've got a talent. You've got something. Go do something with this. He used to say this to me over and over and over and over again. Why do we have to repeat ourselves so many times as a coach? because you're waiting for the timing to line up when finally that athlete hears you. That's what that moment was. I was literally sitting in an interview in my suit, trying to say, you know, okay, this is, here we go again. Oh, how many manholes are there in New York? That's actually one of their questions. How many airplanes are in the sky at one time? <sighs> Whatever. And I literally just got up and said, this is it. I want to go on to the next level. Three years is all I was asking myself to commit. What the hell is three years when you're 21? It was 1997. I go to my coach and I say, Coach, what have you been telling me? He said, you got a gift. 
how do you think this is going to work? He said, well, you can't do it here. We'd love to work with you here, but you need to go on to the next level. So I ended up partnering. I found a, he found a coach for me out in California, a guy named Robert Weir, um, which is a, I'll, if we have time, I'll, I might come back to Robert because he is a personality in and of himself. Um, but uh, I, uh, I made the voyage. I made the first step in my Olympic journey. And I heard someone talk about dreams earlier and believing. In, in Olympic sports, there's a guy named Pierre de Coubertin who is the founder of the modern Olympics. And he used to say, uh, he used to stress the importance of the struggle. The struggle, right? And in doing so, he'd say, look, in any, in any competition, there's only going to be one winner, but there's going to be a lot of victories along the way. You enter the fray. That's the first one, right? You make that decision. You take that action. And when you did that in the Olympic movement, you went from being just some guy with a dream to an Olympic hopeful, right? I totally hate that term. Everybody has a dream. Everybody has hope. How many of you take action on those dreams? Small percentage. What's hope? What is, but so I started to ask, like, you know what? This was the first time when I transitioned from an athlete, a hopeful, someone with a dream, into a faithful person. See, hope is faith put into action. And that's the moment when you, as, when you are working with your athletes and you see them make this transition from going for, through the motions and relying on whatever gifts they've been given to taking ownership of those gifts, taking the steps, and looking for new answers, new opportunities, and new ways to grow. That's what I call an Olympic faithful. Take action. The people in this room, I heard, uh, who was it? Uh, I think it was Lindsay. Someone was talking about foundations during their, um, during their uh, presentation. And I think that's a really important concept, particularly for the people in this room. You all are the builders of foundations. I read an article about a hotel called the Burj Khalifa. It's one of the tallest hotels in the world, if not still the tallest. It's this magnificent structure. Huge, huge scales. I don't know how many hundreds of stories, a hundred stories in the skies. Massive. People always look at it and say, wow, that's an amazing structure. But the most impressive thing about this structure is not what we see, but what we don't see. It has 198 board piles that go 200 feet into the ground this thick. That foundation is what allows this great thing to build. When I shifted from a hopeful to a faithful person, I started building this foundation, shoring this up. I moved to California. There's gold there in them hills. I moved in with, I moved into a house called The Stable. There were tw uh, 10 of us when I first lived there. Five bedroom house. I lived into, I moved into the closet underneath the stairs. I jokingly say this, I think I was a source of J.K. Rowling's inspiration for Harry Potter. But greatness can come and start in a lot of places, and it's not where you start, it's ultimately where you finish. I'm going to kind of jump around a little bit here. I, I, uh, three years, that's what I gave myself. And when you commit yourself wholeheartedly, when you commit yourself to getting under the bar, when you commit yourself to getting into the fray, when you commit to yourself whatever you're committing yourself to, you can only do it 100%. In the trials and tribulations that you face, mine were never life and death, but they sure as hell felt really real to me. I hear the story of guys like Rudy and those guys, and I wish, I hope, I, I pray that if I were ever in their situation, I would have the courage to follow through in the ways that they had. Because I can tell you in my own life, which was full of self-made obstacles, I wasn't always up to the test. I, uh, 99, I had committed, it was at the end of 1999, I was feeling good, I was improving, I was about number eight in the world, which sounds great until you realize that five of the people ahead of you are in the United States, and they take the top three from the Olympic trials into the uh, Olympic Games, and I uh, was training one day, 
on a warm-up doing bench press, 365 pounds, should have been like, you know, I could do this in my sleep. Fifth rep, boom, blow my pec out. Didn't have insurance at the time. That's a bad mistake. But I was lucky because my network, there was a guy named Dr. Dillingham, and uh, Dilly was the uh, doctor for the 49ers at the time, and he saw me for free. And uh, I go in there, and, and I, this is something that I have in common with Derek and with, with, with John, is that I've had doctors give, deliver brutal honesty. He says, Adam, he said, you need surgery. And that's the end of your throwing career. You can't come back from this. I was living in a house. I was living in a closet underneath the stairs. I'd moved literally 3,000 miles across the country. I had no family, no friends in that area. And you're telling me that it's over because I had a bad day at the gym. And he said, yeah. And I said, well, I don't have insurance, so I can't pay for a surgery right now. And he's like, that's yeah, okay. Take your time. There's no rush for it. And as I was walking out, he says, wait, 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 wait. There's a chance. He said, if you go and you commit yourself to doing rehab, there's a chance you might be ready. A chance you might be ready by May. And I felt like that moment in Dumb and Dumber. Do you guys remember that movie? Or is that... So you're saying there's a chance, baby, all right. What is it? Where do I sign up? He hooked me up with a lady named Lisa Giannini who had a physical therapy practice out in San Francisco. She was fantastic. I worked out with her, well, at first like five days a week, then three days a week for six hours every single day. By May, something happened, and I started able to actually throw again, not with a 16-pound shot, but with an 8-pound shot. Or sorry, it was April, uh, April, April of the fall of 2000. I, I was able to throw uh, an eight-pound shot, and as everything started coming back, everything started coming back. All of a sudden, I started throwing the 16-pound shot in May of that year, and I was throwing really far. I'm like, what the hell just happened? Well, this injury forced me to do something. Remember what I said about my workouts? 100 reps, 665 for 10. That was sort of my foundation. So I was in this perpetually overtrained state. The injury forced me not only to rest, but to change the way I, chain, I train. And yeah, it was like five months later, but I was thriving. And I felt super explosive. Derek was talking about his jumps. I never hit 42 inches in a vertical, but I was at 40. My standing broad jumps were like 11 and a half feet. We did all sorts of crazy jumping. I can't tell you all the ones. We just made shit up, okay? <laughs> like, I would do, like, single leg, three hops. We would do five. Anyway, we do all sorts of crazy stuff. That's how I trained. That's how I compensated for this injury. And the, the result was, by accident, I started doing something that probably resembled velocity-based training or maybe some post-activation potentiation. Maybe some people know that as triphasic. I don't know what you guys know it as today. But it was working for me. And I got into the ring again. I started throwing farther and farther and farther and farther. I get called by USA Track and Field, who's our national federation. They say, can you be at a meet on Friday? And it was Monday, and I was working full time. And I said, yes. Well, when, I said, when's the meet? He said, it's Friday. I said, OK. And uh, they said, well, we'll get a plane ticket for you. You can leave on Wednesday night, all that stuff. Get on the plane, fly out to my first professional meet in Raleigh, North Carolina walk into the lobby of the hotel, and two of my competitors are sitting there. Two guys I've known for about 10 years. And they said, they're talking about the trials. They said, well, it's going to be Andy Bloom, Kevin Toth, CJ Hunter, John Godina, um, somebody else. And I looked at them and said, guys, I'm standing right here. Oh, you're on the bubble. And I looked at him. This is the truth, true. Looked at him and I said, Y'all just made the biggest fucking mistake of your life. And I went up, and for the first time that whole year, I was angry. And I mean, really angry. I go out the next day at the competition. I PR. I beat everybody but the defending world champion. I, I threw 70 feet 4 inches, which 70 feet is sort of the benchmark for medal contention. Several weeks later, we go into the Olympic trials. 
and I was no longer on the bubble. I was in contention. I step into the circle for my last throw of the day. At that point, I already knew I was on the team. And the moment kind of came together. We work for these moments in our lives where everything just kind of clicks, right? You guys ever had that? They call it being in the zone. Maybe you play baseball. You see that baseball coming at you, and everything's in slow motion. I had that moment. And so I step into the back of the circle. And when I explode back to life, the shot put goes 72 feet, 7 inches. The five-foot PR over the year before. That's huge. And I was now the favorite for the Olympic Games. I was an overnight success. That term's bullshit. <laughs> so um, I go to Sydney. So the 2000 Olympic Games are in Sydney. And I'm going to tell one or two stories about, I mean, I'm going to tell one story about Sydney. Um, and um, Sydney's an amazing city. If you've never been there, it is probably, hands down, one of my favorite cities in the world. It's beautiful, great people. Um, and going for an Olympics is probably the best time in the world to go to any city in the, country, in the world. And uh, it was just fantastic. I don't know if I was fully prepared for that moment. I heard uh, Derek say this the other day. I was not necessarily prepared mentally for what I was going to experience there. One of the things that happens at an Olympic Games, you get everybody of any importance comes out. Some of the times, those people are actually value added. Some of them are just distractions. One to me was very much a value added interaction and personality for me. I got the chance to meet Tommy Lasorda. Does everybody know who Tommy Lasorda is? Baseball manager, Hall of Fame, fantastic guy. I got to know him over the course of the 14 days I was there, and he says, uh, I see him while I'm walking out of the, uh, the, uh, the food court in the, in the Olympic Village, and he, I see him, and he says to me, Nelson, right now, he is Coach Tommy Lasorda, and he remembers my name. He's in the middle of a story. He interrupts his story that he's talking to these people and says, Nelson, this is a cool moment for a kid that thought he might be a baseball player if football didn't work out, okay? <laughs> so he says, so he, goes, he looks at me, and says, when do you, when do you play? We throw, but you do not coach. You do not correct the Hall of Fame coaches. So I play on Friday, coach. <laughs> <laughs> and he says to me, he says, well, how do you think you're going to do? And I said, coach, you know, I'm from Georgia. I grew up, I, I, I was taught to be very humble. Um, and he said, I said, coach, I said, I can only go out there and try my best, right? I saw the blood start to boil. And here's this, and he's an old man at this time. He looks like my grandfather if I had one. I didn't have one, so, but he would look like him if that's what I had. That was really awkward. <laughs> <laughs> so he says, he's, he, I see the blood start to boil, then all of a sudden, try, losers, try, boy, winners, go out there and do, you gotta do, 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 do. Okay. <laughs> Let me just give, paint the picture here. The food court at the Olympic Village, the most popular place, the most populated place in the Olympic Village, hundreds if not thousands of people passing through every few minutes of, 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 of the day. Coach Lasorda is giving me a, 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 a pep talk. And he's just in my face. And he's going, dude, boy, dude! And I'm like, all right, let's do it, baby! Hell yeah! <laughs> Damn, I'm tired again. <laughs> so I want to illustrate that point. Uh, i got to take it back a notch. Um, there's a difference between trying and doing. It's the same difference between being a hopeful and a faithful. When you take ownership of something, you're, going, you're committing to doing that thing. If you fail, there are no excuses. There's no finger pointing. You own it. I'd made, it to the num I'd made it to the largest sporting stage in the world. Sorry, FIFA. <laughs> and I never heard anybody say it quite like that. Never forget that. You'll work with people who say, 
Oh, I'm trying my best. Bullshit. Do it. So I go out on the next, it was two days later, that was a Wednesday, and uh, I compete in the 2000 Olympics. I've made a mess up here. Um, you guys took the insurance out on this thing, right? Yeah. Um, good. And, uh, and uh, so I, I compete in a game of inches. Literally, that much or less can be the difference between first, second, and third. I went out and I had a bad day. I'm not going to make any excuses for it. I didn't perform, and I got beat by a guy from Finland who had a career day. But I walked away with this, and I don't bring these out very often, as most people know. But I think this is, Bert and I have known each other for a long time. I don't think I've ever shown this to him. It's a silver medal from the 2000 Olympics. I lost by two and a half inches. I did this on a whim. Not a whim. I really was trying to put off an inevitable thing of getting a job, doing something that I happened to enjoy doing, lifting, training, throwing the shot put. And I was two and a half inches short of winning gold. That's all I needed to stick around for another four years. Four years has been a mantra for a lot of my life. Four more years. Let's do it. Four more years. Probably a lot longer than anybody else in my family or friends would say I should have done it. Four more years. So I recommitted myself to this goal. The following year, 2001, silver at the World Championships. 2003, silver at the World Championships. 2004, I'm going to come back to 2004, so I'm going to put the footnote on it right now. Silver at the Olympic Games. The um, press labeled me the first loser. They were brutal. They held that mirror up. They said, look, this is as good as you are. My process was flawed. So I sought somebody out that knew more. I first, started, I first talked to Judd Logan, a man who'd been there and done it. I have a lot of respect for that man. And he pointed me in the direction of another, uh, of a strength coach by the name of Charles Poliquin. And Charles was kind enough to see me and work with me for a little over, well, for the, we've worked off and on for 10 years now, or I guess I can't do math because I'm a shot putter. That was 2003, 2000, uh, sorry, I started working with him in 2003, and I worked with him from 2004 2006, sometimes in 2007, and then we consult on a fairly regular basis. But um, Charles changed the way I train. So when I went into that 2004 Olympic Games, I was faster, I was stronger, I was ready to throw. I'm going to tell you the story about the 2004 Olympic Games. It's unique in sports. It happened at the ancient Olympic Stadium in, the, in Olympia, Greece. The birthplace of all competitive sports as we know it. There was no such thing as produced sports until the Olympic Games. And this is where it all started. I'm a high energy guy when I compete. This is a small venue. This is tailor made for me. I can remember everything about this day. We walk in through the ruins of the, the ancient Olympic buildings and such, and there's, a, there's an arch that still stands in this cut through the hillside, because the stadium is really no more than a bowl. And I walk through that, and I can see, I, you can feel it. It was so freaking hot that day. There's no shade anywhere. It's just a bowl of dust. There are 25,000 people there just to see the shot put. First throw of the day, I take the lead. There are 60 throws total in an Olympic competition. For 58 of those 60 throws, I'm winning. On the 59th throw of the competition, we don't take 60 throws, it's 60 throws across the field, just so you know. <laughs> On the 59th throw of the competition, the guy that had been trailing me in the second, second place from the Ukraine tied my best mark. The tie-breaking rule in Olympic Games goes back 
to your second best throw. I had four fouls since my first throw. This is that moment that we dream of as children. Except instead of shooting that three-point shot with two seconds left on the game or catching that winning touchdown, I'm stepping into the circle on the largest stage of the sporting world. I have to throw farther to win. This is a, not a bad time in American history, but we weren't well-liked. Americans weren't. I step into this ring, and I mean, I can, I can actually taste this day. Uh, when I, Derek was talking about how when you start thinking about these things, it takes you back to that moment. I can see everything about that day. I can see the person that was sitting, like literally right here, um, the hat that he was wearing. I can feel the sweat on my neck. I can, I can feel the chalk on my, on my neck that we use to try to keep the ball stuck on our neck on when it's super hot and we're sweating like crazy. I had one task, clarity. I knew when I stepped into that circle that what happened afterwards was going to dictate the rest or at least the next few days, few years of my life. It was going to be a dis determining factor in my life, that moment. And I can remember stepping into the circle. People were either cheering or booing. I got people clapping because that's what I like to do. And they started clapping, some of them, some of them were booing. And I stepped into the circle, and I remember, I remember planting my feet. I remember when the, when the shot put touched the, cool, the, cool, the coolness of the steel, touching my neck, and all of a sudden I felt this surge of adrenaline. <gasps> <gasps> Fucking, I see the shot put fly farther than it had flown the whole day before. It was at least two feet farther. It comes down. I just won the Olympic Games. I'm like, I fucking won. And I look to my left, and I see a red flag raise. I fouled. Now, the other corner of my eye, I see the athlete from the Ukraine start his victory lap. For eight years, I thought that competition was over. For eight years. I get a call, 2012, from a reporter, because where's my German friend? The Associated Press from Germany had leaked a story about 100 samples from the Athens Olympic Games being retested. And five athletes had tested positive. She calls me and she says, hey, have you heard anything? Little PR communications dealing with reporters. When a reporter calls you and says, hey, have you heard anything, and you don't know what they're talking about, do not give them an answer. <laughs> Clarify it. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, they retested the samples. Five of them, it's rumored that one of the guys was a shot putter. I haven't heard anything. London Olympics go by. I don't hear anything. There's an eight-year statute of limitations on retroactive drug testing. That eight years passed during the Olympic Games. So this high that you might have from getting this phone call is followed by an immediate low again. And it wasn't the first time that this had happened. It had actually happened three weeks, six weeks, and six months after the actual Olympics. We've been told that someone had tested positive. You stop listening to those things, and all of a sudden, I find myself coming down in this low, and then I get a call in uh, September of 2012 from the same reporter. She says, have you heard anything? I said, we've played this game before. What are we talking about? Well, the IOC is supposed to make a ruling today. While I'm on the phone with her, she says, oh, my God. You're the Olympic gold medalist. This. Yeah. I, <laughs> uh, eight years. I share this story. This is usually where I start to get emotional, so I'm going to try not to do that in order to get through the story a little bit. Um, you commit yourself to getting under a bar. You commit yourself to entering the fray. You commit yourself to the fight. You commit yourself to the outcome, the outcome that you deserve. Sports is not like life. There are rules. 
And I'd been cheated of eight years as a gold medalist. And unfortunately, in this country, the color of your medal matters, and so does the timing. Gold, eight years later, does not mean as much as it does in the moment. And so I had this, I had this, um, a new struggle. This uh, was why I started doing, this is why I moved to California in the first place. This was um, why I think most people get inspired to do the Olympic Games or try out or become an Olympic faithful. And to win one, if you're an Olympic athlete, it's supposed to be the pinnacle of your sport. Yet all I felt was robbed. All I felt was cheated. All I felt was lied to, failed. It's not a positive emotion. And then I remembered that something that I, I've talked to a couple of the other athletes in the room about. This is a moment in life. And if you define your happiness and your success by a moment, you've got to have a shitload of moments to be happy. How long is an Olympic ceremony? The actual gift of receiving an Olympic medal? It's over as soon as you receive it. And if I define myself by that medal, I will constantly be living in the past. So I heard uh, Rudy talking about the weights, how we define ourselves by numbers. It's not the numbers that define you. It's the process you take to get there. If your process is flawed, you're going to have flawed results. If your process is cheating, if your process is taking shortcuts, it's going to catch up with you in the long run. Ingrid did some things with mobility and stability today that we all need to wrap up into our own programs on a daily basis because those are the things that are going to elevate performance for the rest of your life. You can take some short-term like options, but in the end, it's going to catch up with you. After the 2004 Olympic Games, I'm going to give you a side note. Not only was I labeled the first loser, I was dropped by my sponsor at the time because they said I was the first loser. Something happened. I didn't want it to happen. But these guys said, you're not good enough. That's Coach Safer back in eighth grade. I'm not good enough. You still talk with a tick. Look, we all have demons. And those demons can make you stronger or they can break you down and it's your choice. If you're looking for an excuse to be mediocre, that's fine. There are a lot of real excuses out there. Go ahead and do it. I keep coming back to Rudy's talk. He talked about the fray. I talk about state. Like most people live with inside these guardrails, right? We set up these guardrails. Why do we put guardrails up? What are they there for? To keep you safe. If you're an athlete, if you're an operator, if you're a strength coach, if you're whatever it is, if you desire to be great, greatness very rarely goes right down the middle of the road. You have to push yourself up onto the edge of the guardrails where everybody else says, you're fucking crazy. That's where I want to live. That's what I spent my whole life pursuing. It was not this. This was a byproduct of living out there on top of the guardrails. Daring to dream big. Daring to take those first steps. Daring to follow through. There were a lot of, a lot of opportunities for me to say, oh, that's enough. And in fact, most reasonable people would probably take some of those opportunities to say, that's enough. But if you really want to be successful in whatever your career is today, whether you're an athlete, whether you're a coach, whether you're an operator, whether you're you know, just a regular Joe, you have to dare to dream big. You have to dare to take those steps and live out there 
on the guardrails. When I realized that, when I realized that life isn't about these medals, it's about this process, I realized that the secret to happiness was not found in a moment. The secret to happiness is thriving in the fray. I heard John say it the other day, I think, I will not, I will not go quietly into the darkness. You guys are strength coaches. Y'all don't go quietly anywhere. I just want to say thank you very much. Yeah. This has been an awesome time. Thanks, Adam. You good? Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot, guys. It's fucking awesome.